Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're all ready. So you guys, we have a guest speaker today, Dr. Ajay Rai Singhani of UCSD. So go ahead and give him a welcoming round of applause. Scheduling uh, errors, we have finally made it. Now, um, tenth grade, right? So, how much have you learned about the heart? Do you already know the physiology? Do you know the not not too much? Zero. Sure. No. We learned a little bit in EMS. Class. Little to nothing. Yeah. Like we learned about like you know, seventh, tenth grade. It varies, doesn't it? AP bio. Oh, that's right. All right. Anyway, so that's fine. I'm going to give you the same talk I gave my fourth, your fourth grader son, but I'm going to increase the level here, so just joking, you'll, you'll enjoy this talk. Now, um, <laughs> I'm going to pass around a model of the heart, okay, and you can just take a look. We'll be talking about it, give you a little perspective on what we're going to be referring to in the anatomy and uh, what's inside the heart. So you can open it up and um, look at the chambers. I will review that. You can look at the valves. Uh, and on the surface is what we call the coronary arteries. It's the actual blood flow to the heart itself, right? And so we'll take a look. Let me just pass that. I'm going to pass around my stethoscope. Gently put it in your ear, and then you can listen to your heart, and you can hear what we're listening to when we're uh, actually looking for patients. Ethan, that's the one that And then finally, at the end, you know, if we have volunteers, I'll be able to uh, do an ultrasound. Nowadays, we've uh, brought the technology down to something like this, and we're able to do an ultrasound. We'll see examples of ultrasounds that we've done on our patients. And we're able to do this, take this with us to the bedside, take this with us to a clinic, and actually take an image. You can imagine if you're in a small village with no health care, and you take this, you can, you know, appreciate it a lot by an image that you can obtain by just taking this echo cardiograph. Normally, the, the regular machine is about as big as half this table, and it costs about $300,000. So they reduced this down to about a $10,000 machine. This is a $10,000 machine here. <laughs> okay, so, you know, first, real briefly, I think most of you are probably aware of this, but medicine is a long haul, you know? You have to believe in delayed gratification if you're going to go into medicine, all right? Nothing's going to come easy to you. And, uh, you know, obviously it starts off with four years of undergraduate after high school. And uh, I understand it's getting harder and harder to get into a good school these days. I have some friends who are kids that are applying. After four years of undergrad or five years or whatever you do, you take what's called the MCATs. And, um, you know, hopefully you'll do well in that. And then you move on to four years of medical school. And mostly once you get into medical school, uh, out of my class, maybe a couple of people dropped out early on, within the six months, but most students uh, make it through and get their degree. You know, they're pretty well, once they commit to you in medical school to come in and they accept you, then they're committed in you being successful in coming out. You know, there's a joke. What do they call the student who's last in class in medical school at the end? They call them an MD still. Yes, right? they say a doctor. A doctor, right. So hopefully you guys won't be in the last of your class. Following medical school, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a day we call match day, and you decide what you want to go into, whether you want to go into internal medicine, whether you want to go into general, general surgery, whether you want to go into anesthesia, dermatology, so you have radiology. So these are all the subspecialties. And basically, uh, you apply, you rank, What's your top choice? So let's say I want to do internal medicine, and my number one choice was Harvard. I put down on Harvard, and obviously you'd go for interviews if they wanted you, and then they would uh, they would put their top choices, and if it matched, your top choice matches with their top choice, you get the spot. Okay, that's called match day. It's a big deal in medical school every year. 
And then, uh, so let's say we're doing, I became a cardiologist, so what I did was three years of internal medicine residency. So that's after medical school, you do three years. Then you apply for fellowship to, cardio to, a, to a subspecial cardiology, and then you do an additional three years of fellowship. And then if you're done with that, you can come out and become a general cardiologist, or then you spend additional years sub-focusing on different aspects of the heart. So you could spend a year doing EP, which is electrophysiology. It's all about the rhythms, and I'll show you some examples. You can do it interventional, one to two years, which is where we, they put in stents in the heart. You know, if somebody's having a heart attack, I'll show you something like that. And then there's another field, which is heart failure transplant. So if you're taking care of patients who have had a heart transplant, that's become a whole science by itself. And it has become pretty uh, technical. We're, we're installing assist devices called left ventricle assist devices to help the ventricle squeeze when it becomes so weak. Uh, and that, that care of those patients is, taken, is basically done by heart failure transplant specialists. All right. So now let's get into the heart. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, once you start your uh, residency, which I've have a basic yeah. Exactly. So the first, you know, um, I thought the first year of residency, which is called internship, uh, was actually the best year because for the first time after all these years, you're finally earning, earning a salary and you're getting paid a little. And you know, in, as you're a fourth year medical student, you, you're always rotating through different uh, clinic locations, as we call them. But every time you would write an order, so let's say start penicillin on a patient, a doctor would have to co-sign it. But when you become a resident, that's the first time you can write it, and the nurses will take it off, and you don't have to have it co-sign. So that was a big relief. Uh, and then your learning curve in those years is just incredible. I mean, the first year, uh, you just learn so much about taking care of patients. That's like actually quite an exciting, it's a little, a little challenging, but a very exciting. Uh, time. Okay, so the heart, right? So it's the circulatory system. And the heart, if you want to think of it in a very basic manner, is just a pump, right? It needs to pump blood to the rest of the body. And obviously the blood carries a lot of important uh, material. It carries oxygen, primarily it carries oxygen to our brains and every other organ, and that's critical. You cut out oxygen to any part of the body, it starts dying. It, it contains, you know, white blood cells that are used for fighting infections, uh, and then it helps maintain a constant body temperature, right? And we sort of re uh, reviewed this. The oxygen is carried in red blood cells called erythrocytes. Uh, the white blood cells are called leukocytes. They fight infection. So when you're like got a cold or something and you feel all stuffed up. It's these leukocytes that have gone to that area and have released a lot of what we call histamines and you get edema and swelling and that's why you have, or if you, have, if you cut your finger and you're red and inflamed, it's the, it's the white blood cells that have gone there and have released all of this to cause that inflammation. Thank you. And then platelets, so that if you cut yourself, you don't want to bleed to death. Uh, you want to be able to clot and that's also part of the whole process of blood. So now, you know, the heart, if you see that model that we have been sending around, you know, we've broken it down to several different components, right? The first one is the arteries, and you can see that these arteries that we refer to are sitting on the surface of the heart, right? And if you think everybody, each one of us has the same basic anatomy. We have an artery that feeds the front of the heart. It's called the left anterior descending. We have an artery that goes around to the back and feeds the back of the heart. And then one that comes down the right side and goes down the bottom, which is called the right coronary artery. So that's the coronary circulation. So if you are developing a blocked artery, or what we call a heart attack, you're having a problem with one of these vessels. And either that's getting plugged up. So any, and we'll, I'll show you an example of this, but if you shut flow down this vessel, Everything it perfuses, meaning everything it feeds blood to starts dying, right? And that's considered a heart attack. Next, we have the electrical system. 
And I don't know if you've accompanied anybody, any of your family members to a, a physician's office and they've done what we call an ECG or an EKG. It's looking at the electrical system. So you can have arrhythmias. You know, you can have extra beats. Suddenly your heart normally uh, should go at about 60 to 80 beats a minute. And it suddenly stops racing with all these arrhythmias that some are dangerous, some are less so, but you know, you can have a whole abnormality with the electrical system. And the electrical system, you need that electrical activity to travel through the heart in order for it to squeeze. So if, there's, if that doesn't exist, the heart's just going to sit there. It won't function as a pump. All right? And then finally, you have the, go back. You have the valves, which you can see, they control the flow of blood and make sure it only goes in one direction. So you could have a, a problem with the valve, which is, it could be narrowed and not open up completely and cause obstruction of the blood, or it could leak back and so become very in inefficient and uh, have a lot of leak uh, back into the upper, into one of these chambers. So here's just a, you know, so this is what we do. This is just a cardiac CT that we can do. It kind of gives you a perspective of how your heart sort of sits. You can see the ribs, uh, the sternum, and then right behind that, comes the, the, the actual heart itself with the vessels and then you can see that how you can zoop, flip it around and you see those vessels sitting on the surface are the ones we are actually talking about. Those are called the coronary arteries. So if you look at the human heart, we tend to divide it into two sections, right? There's the right side and the left side. And so if you look at the, if we focus on the right side, we've colored it blue because it carries unoxygenated blood, right? So, the, so it, all the blood that's in our body, in our brains, organs, kidneys, oxygen is used up and it travels back to the right side of the heart. From the upper upper body, it comes down the superior vena cava, and then from the lower body, it comes down, it comes up the inferior vena cava enters into the right atrium, travels down into the right ventricle, gets pumped to the lungs, where we breathe, we re-oxygenate the blood, and it re-enters down into the left side, which is this right side, left atrium, left ventricle, through the mitral valve, and eventually gets pumped out to the aorta, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart, right? So everything out of the heart comes into this vessel called the aorta. And then from there, it starts perfusing your brain. The first branches that come out of the aorta are back to the heart itself, those coronary vessels that you see. So those are the first branches that come out of the heart. Here's another. So here's what we've just covered. Deoxygenated blood returns from the body on the right side, up to the lungs. You breathe in air, breathe in oxygen, goes back to the blood, comes back to the left side, goes out to the body. And it's, it's one big circle, right? It's just going to go around this one direction. So here's another depiction of it coming, blues coming, goes to the lungs, we breathe, there's gas exchange, comes back to the left side, goes out. In the body, we use up all that oxygen, every organ. Func There's no organ in our body that functions without oxygen, all right? And so you use it all up, send it back. So you can see the flow is one directional, right? So if you have a valve here that's controlling that, if that starts leaking, it starts going the other way around and creates problems that can uh, sort of progress depending on the extent of the damage. Any questions so far? Now, so here's the electrical system of the heart, right? So normally we have what we call a pacemaker in the heart. The pacemaker in the heart is called the sinus node, okay? And that's what we're going to point to right here. Now the sinus node has the ability to generate an electrical activity spontaneously. It doesn't need a signal. It doesn't need any sort of stimulus. It just does that every Let's say you're going at 60 beats a minute. Every second, it'll send a signal down. This signal travels through a very special pathway, sort of comes to this junction here called the AV node, 
travels through to the main pumping chambers and then the heart squeezes. All right? So we call normal rhythm in a human being sinus rhythm because it's originating from the sinus node. So normal rhythm is called sinus rhythm. And so any arrhythmia, meaning any abnormal heart rhythm, we name it based on where in the heart it's originating. So the upper chambers are called the atria, the bottom chambers are called the ventricles. So anything originating in the upper chambers are called like atrial arrhythmias. Anything originating in the bottom chambers are called ventricular arrhythmias, right? Okay, so here, now this is an example of an EKG. This is what we do. When you will go into the office, we'll put 12 leads on your chest and we'll, we'll actually um, get these tracings. And when you look at these tracings, we can tell you where the, where the rhythm is originating. Is it sinus rhythm? Is it going too fast? It tells us, gives us a lot of information here. So let's look at this. I'll make you all experts in reading an EKG. So if you start, let's start with one of these little ditzels here. You see that little signal there? A little bump? That's called a P wave. That P wave means that the signal is originating from the sinus node. All right? So you've got a P wave there, and then followed by the P wave is a little distance, and then you get this spike. And we call that the QRS. That QRS represents activity traveling through the main pumping chamber. And then the final step here is this, this little bump there called the T wave, right? And so that's repolarization. Everything goes back to normal before the next beat can come through and, can, and the heart can contract again. So if you see these spikes, you know, it's fairly regular. You have P wave, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, and they're, and they're going, boom. So each one of these spikes represents a heartbeat, okay? And you can see the distance between these is slightly different, right? And so there's a slight arrhythmia here, but mostly it's sinus rhythm. We see a P wave in front of every spike, right? Uh, I want you to read this other EKG for me, which is abnormal. What do you think, guys? Quiz. How do we start? Uh, this, is, this is one of my patients. Uh, yeah, there's something different about at V2. Yeah, V2. Yeah. Well, everywhere, right? Yeah, but I see like, um, at least from what I observe, the second one from the top at V2, that's a lot different from the second one from the bottom. Yeah, right. So, okay, let's go through this. And you see, here's. You know, let's forget, that's, that's an abnormal beat, but let's go down here and let's look at this one, right? So here is the P wave. We said this was a P wave, right? The small bump up right there. Then we see the QRS and then we see the T wave. So that looks like a normal beat. And then you get the next beat coming and that you see a P wave again and then you see the QRS and the T wave. And then pay attention to the distance between these two beats, right? This distance re represents time. So if we count these little boxes, that's about one box, two box, three box, four boxes. So one beat, and then four boxes later, you get another beat, okay? But then if you look at the third beat here, that's different, right? It looks completely different from the QRS here. It's much wider. What else do you see? It comes much sooner, right? So look, it's four, it's four boxes. One box, two box, three box, four box. Here, it's one box, two, about two and a half boxes. So it's early, right? So we call that, and it's, it's wider. And then, you, and then that following that, there's a longer pause. There's like a much longer period. And then you're back to your normal rhythm, back to your normal rhythm and then you get another cute, another crazy looking signal there, right? So, is there a P wave in front of this signal? Yeah, the little bump right in front of it. Yeah, the little bump in there is actually this bump, the T wave, see that? So, this 
is premature, so we'll call it a premature B, right? It comes early. It's wide, so the, we can tell if it's so wide, we know that it's coming from the bottom chamber, so it's a ventricular B, all right? And so we call this, what we call this is a premature ventricular B. And so if you, if you talk to the person, they may come to you complaining that they're getting a lot of extra beats. You know, normally we're sitting here, we don't feel our heartbeat. We don't, you know, you don't pay attention to it. Maybe when you're sleeping in bed and you got the wrong, you may be able to feel each heartbeat. But most of the time, you don't feel anything, right? But this one, what you're going to feel, I have patients who feel nothing, and in a 24-hour period, the last guy I was evaluating had about 30,000 of these beats. So that means every third beat was a premature beat. And he says, I don't, I don't really feel that. While I have other people, they have like maybe 50 of them in a 24-hour period. And every time they have one, they're like, oh, doc, I'm, I'm dying. And I feel this crazy beat in my heart. But what they're actually feeling, they don't feel this beat. They feel the beat following it because there's a longer pause and the heart has a longer period to fill with blood. And then when it contracts, it pumps a lot more blood and they feel it in the neck, they may feel an extra beat. And so we call these premature beats. Very common, we see a lot of patients with something like that. Usually it can represent significant heart disease, but a lot of times it may just be a benign PVC. So this is an example of like a arrhythmia that we're seeing. So let's move on to the actual muscle of the heart, right? Oh, unfortunately, uh, our lunch period just ended just uh, now with the bell. Oh, you're done? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, the lunch period just ended. Thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for our guests.